This is podcast number two of a Bible study on the book of Daniel. In podcast number one, we looked at chapter one and the text and some of the points of interpretation. In this podcast, now we will look at some of the lessons that can be gleaned from the chapter. The first lesson is the operation of God's providence. As we saw in chapter one, verse two, it was the Lord who gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, and in verse 15 gave Daniel favor in the sight of the chief eunuch, and in verse 17 gave Daniel learning and skill in all letters and wisdom. So despite great turmoil in the land and in Daniel's life caused by circumstances beyond his control, he was not left alone. God was with Daniel and would use his struggles to bring good out of evil. On a wider scale, God was active in the entire Babylonian captivity by placing holy people in key positions. So while Daniel is ministering in Babylon to the power base of Nebuchadnezzar and his court of pagan advisors, God had placed Jeremiah positioned in Jerusalem, ministering to the people who were left languishing without leadership. And God placed the prophet Ezekiel in the countryside of Babylon, ministering to the Jewish captives who were being continually tormented by their pagan rulers. So in all these ways, God is orchestrating events according to his will and purpose. As Psalm 103 verse 19 states, quote, The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all, end of quote. And Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, quote, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch over the evil and the good. End of quote. We see many other examples of God's providence at work in Scripture. In the book of Esther, a pious Jew by the name of Hadassah is suddenly thrown into a worldwide conflict involving Persia and its desire to conquer Greece and the wicked Haman in his effort to wipe out the Jewish people. After King Xerxes of Persia, in a drunken state, deposes Queen Vashti, the search is on for a young maiden to take her place, and Hadassah is conscripted. Wanting to keep her Jewish identity secret, she takes on the name of Esther. When her uncle Mordecai discovers Haman's plot to murder all the Jews, and Haman having convinced Xerxes to sign the edict, Mordecai exhorts his cousin, Queen Esther, to approach the king. Esther is reluctant, however, because a Persian decree states that anyone who comes into the king's presence without being called faces immediately the death penalty. The key verse in the book of Esther, then, is spoken by Mordecai. Quote, If you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish, and who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this, end of quote. That's chapter 4, verse 14. So trusting in God's providence, and after having prayed and fasted, Esther acts. She approaches the king, receives his favor, and the Jews are saved. The lesson is that although Hadassah had her life turned upside down, yet by cooperating with God's providence and seeing the opportunity as it presented itself, her life made a significant difference despite the suffering. And perhaps God has prepared us to act in such a time as this. As we continue to reflect on this theme of God's providence, we can ask, What about today? The world is immersed in a pandemic that affects everyone. Did this take God by surprise? Could he not have intervened to stop the virus before it spread? The Catechism of the Catholic Church is relevant here. In paragraph 310, the Church states, quote, But why did God not create a world so perfect that no evil could exist in it? With infinite power, God could always create something better, But with infinite wisdom and goodness, God freely created a world in a state of journeying toward its ultimate perfection. In God's plan, this process of becoming involves the appearance of certain beings and the disappearance of others 
the existence of the more perfect alongside the less perfect, both constructive and destructive forces of nature. With physical good there exists also physical evil as long as creation has not reached perfection." End of quote. And continuing in paragraph 324, quote, The fact that God permits physical and even moral evil is a mystery that God illuminates by his Son Jesus Christ, who died and rose to vanquish evil. Faith gives us the certainty that God would not permit an evil if he did not cause a good to come from that very evil by ways that we shall fully know only in eternal life." End of quote. So how should we respond? Like Daniel, prayer is key. Daniel did not, in his exile and suffering, isolate himself spiritually. He prayed three times a day, even against the edict of the king, and God responded. Daniel found hope and strength for the future as regards himself and his pagan surroundings. Daniel's wisdom in advising the king came from his relationship with God. By calling on the name of Yahweh, Daniel and his three friends knew not only how to survive, but how to flourish in the midst of a turbulent empire and even to evangelize the king. When Daniel and his friends no longer had access to the sacrifices of the Jewish temple, they offered themselves as a living sacrifice and kept to their traditions. In our forced isolation, where the sacraments are severely restricted, we can still carry on Catholic traditions and devotions by such things as praying the rosary, the chaplet of divine mercy, saying an act of contrition, and by reading the scriptures of the day. Regarding the Eucharist, God knows our desire for union with him and grants the graces that we need. When we cannot be physically present at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we are still not deprived of participating. The Vatican II document, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, reminds us that the Eucharist is both a sacrament and a sacrifice. In your common priesthood received as one of the fruits of baptism, you can make a sacrifice of your life to God each and every day, and join that offering with the sacrifice of Christ in the Mass. In the private Masses that priests are still saying, one of the prayers state, quote, Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father, end of quote. What sacrifices can you offer? Well, the Catechism, again, is helpful here in paragraph 1368, quote, the Church, which is the body of Christ, participates in the offering of her head. With him, she herself is offered whole and entire. She unites herself to his intercession with the Father for all men. In the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ becomes also the sacrifice of the members of his body. The lives of the faithful, their praise, sufferings, prayer, and work are united with those of Christ and with his total offering, and so acquire a new value. Christ's sacrifice present on the altar makes it possible for all generations of Christians to be united with his offering. End of quote. And so be encouraged in your morning prayer to make an offering of your life and join that to the offering of Christ. In other words, make the offering of Christ your own, since you are Christ's body through baptism. A beautiful prayer in this regard is the prayer of the Divine Chaplet, which includes this petition, quote, Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world, end of quote. So like Daniel, who while in exile had no access to the liturgy of the temple in Jerusalem, yet offered himself as an oblation or a holocaust, may we do the same as we pray for the intentions of the Holy Father, for the Church, for an end to this pandemic, for those who have died, for the sick and suffering, for those on the front lines of health care, and for the conversion of souls. Another theme is introduced briefly in verse 2 of chapter 1. 
after the sacred vessels stolen from the Jerusalem temple are transferred by Nebuchadnezzar into the temple of his pagan gods. The issue of divine contest between Yahweh and paganism is one that develops throughout the entire book. There are actually two levels of conflict in operation here. One is human, where Daniel and his friends come face to face with the rulers of Babylon. But a second is on a higher spiritual plane where the stakes are much greater. Were the pagan gods victorious over Yahweh when they took possession of his sacred vessels? It would seem so to Nebuchadnezzar, because just as he took captive the peoples of Judah in a triumphant campaign, so his chief guard, Marduk, likewise seems to have conquered and captured Judah's god. But not so fast. One is reminded here of the story in 1 Samuel chapters 4 and 5, where the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines and placed in the temple of their chief god, Dagon, thereby appearing that the god of Israel had been defeated. However, the very next day the Philistines discovered that Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark, his head and hands broken off, and also the people break out with tumors. So they return the Ark of the Covenant and are made well. Likewise, in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, although the sacred vessels are put in the temple of Marduk, in fact the same vessels will lead to the downfall of Babylon. When King Belshazzar commits sacrilege, using those vessels in his drunken feast to worship his false gods. For us today, the divine contest is still operative and we are involved. As St. Paul reminds us, the Christian life is a battle against rulers and authorities in high places. In Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10, we read, quote, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. End of quote. For St. Paul, this armor includes truth, righteousness, faith, the word of God, and prayer. In fact, this spiritual battle goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the Fall. God confronts the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, and in the presence of Adam and Eve, he states, quote, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and you shall strike his heel, end of quote. If we follow the story thereafter in the history of salvation, we see a continual attempt by Satan and his followers to either wipe out the righteous line that began when Seth called on the name of the Lord, or so corrupt the line through sin that it would fail to bring forth the Messiah. So in the books of Esther and Judith, physical attacks are made on the Jews to eliminate them altogether, and in the rest of the Old Testament, spiritual attacks attempt to corrupt the line. All this is highlighted in the book of Revelation chapter 12, where we have the great conflict between the woman clothed with the sun and the dragon who seeks to devour her child, and failing in that attempt, goes off to make war against the rest of her offspring, that is, the church. So we are part of this spiritual battle, which is why we continue to call on the name of the Lord and invoke the woman clothed with the sun, that is, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the communion of saints, and when our churches open once again, to stay close to the sacraments and recognize that we can be co-redeemers in this battle by praying for one another, offering sacrifices and our sufferings for the salvation of souls. The third lesson that we can learn from this chapter one is the value of detachment, that is exercising self-discipline, self-denial, asceticism or mortification in order to give up those goods that are keeping us away from more truly following the Lord. In the case of Daniel, 
it was resisting the enticements of the king to eat and drink from his table, because he knew that such a capitulation would not be pleasing to God, as it would involve Daniel in the eating of unclean foods that were sacrificed to pagan gods. So Daniel resolves to detach himself from this sensual pleasure, and this will be the beginning of his being used by God very powerfully in a pagan culture. Detachment has many benefits for us in our spiritual walk. For example, it helps us to realize the cost of discipleship. We see this in the New Testament with the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus responds by saying, Keep the commandments, which the rich young ruler says he does. Jesus, looking on him in love, says, quote, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. End of quote. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. But the rich young ruler's countenance fell, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The rich young ruler was so attached to his possessions that they possessed him and were his highest good. We have a splendid example of detachment in the gospel when Jesus goes into the desert to confront Satan, and after fasting forty days and forty nights, Satan entices him by saying, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus replies, quoting scripture, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In fact, the three temptations that Jesus faced in the desert are summarized by the beloved disciple in his first letter. So in John chapter 2 we hear, quote, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. That's 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 15. This threefold concupiscence of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life must be mastered by us. And one of the most important ways we can do this is through detachment, exercising self-discipline, self-denial, mortification of the flesh. One of the saddest examples of failure in this regard came in the book of Exodus when Israel was led out of captivity in Egypt. After God had manifested his power through the ten plagues culminating in the Passover and leading the Israelites through the Red Sea and providing the people manna from heaven and water from a rock, the people still complain and are bitter, angry against Moses and God because they don't have the same quality of food that they enjoyed in Egypt, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and so on. The result of this murmuring and ingratitude is that none of that generation made it into the Promised Land. They all died in the desert except Joshua and Caleb. For us today, the question can be asked, what do we need to detach from? Perhaps excessive time watching television or on the internet so as to increase our time with God in prayer or perhaps fasting from always being inclined to purchase things that we really don't need, that is, living more simply so as to exercise charity. In this pandemic, detachment is in a sense being forced upon us. Social distancing, not being able to work, or to go to school, or gather for public worship, is difficult. However, there are many opportunities to use this time for greater prayer, offering our suffering for the sake of the salvation of the world, and perhaps strengthening the bonds of love within our families, which is, after all, the domestic church. In a later podcast, I will explore in greater detail the domestic church and how our families can be instruments in the hands of God, as were Daniel and his three friends. <laughs>